Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to our webinar series, Israel in Context. The webinar is uh, presented and brought to you today by the Center for Israel Education here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it's part of a webinar series which we're conducting uh, over the uh, uh, next couple of months uh, about um, Israel and the context and consequences of events. Uh, as they unfold. It's a pleasure for me to uh, steer this discussion today and the webinar with um, Ambassador Itamar Rabinovich, Aaron David Miller, and Joel Greenberg. Thank Joel for joining us from Jerusalem, Aaron and Itamar from the East Coast. All three of our uh, uh, participants today are uh, highly distinguished. Um, and we're going to try and focus on an event that took place 30 years ago um, and take a look and see what lessons might be learned, if any, uh, about um, the uh, negotiating process. What happened then to make it unfold? In organizing the webinar, um, CIE's focus is on context. Uh, intentionally, this discussion is not primarily aimed at contemporary diplomacy. Though at the end of our discussions, as I, as I suggest, may in fact uh, deal precisely with that. We want to take a look at what transpired in 1991 that caused that conference to unfold. It wasn't the first Middle East conference to uh, have transpired. It was one in 1973. One was attempted in 1977. And there was one, um, uh, two previously, one at Lausanne in 48, 49, and one in London in 1939. They were all a little bit different. Our goal is to um, broaden understanding, uh, to get away from polemics and the politics of uh, the environment. A brief word about our guests. Aaron David Miller is a, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he focuses on US foreign policy. Uh, between 78 and 2003, he worked at the State Department uh, in various capacities, even in, in the office of the historian, which gives him great credibility. He was engaged in several negotiations, including Madrid, the Oslo process, Camp David II in 2000. And he served, if I'm not mistaken, five, six or seven secretaries of state. Itamar Rabinovich is a former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. and former president of Tel Aviv University. Uh, he led the post-Madrid Israel-Syria negotiations under uh, Prime Minister Rabin. Underlying his distinguished academic and uh, diplomatic career, uh, Itamar is also a Middle East historian with a special focus on Syria, having published wild, widely on that topic. Joel Greenberg is a veteran uh, Jerusalem journalist, now working for the BBC. Uh, he was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard, and has reported extensively on Israel and the Palestinians for three decades, including major American newspapers. At that time, in 1991, he was reporting for the Jerusalem Post. To set the context before I ask Aaron uh, to kick us off, there are several events in the 1980s that uh, unfolded that led the conference to emerge. Uh, there was the US uh, coalition that drove Saddam from uh, Kuwait. There was the uh, effort by Secretary Baker, a rather heroic and um, ponderous, if not um, long uh, engagement in trying to get the respective sides to speak to one another, or at least agree to speak to one another at a conference. There was uh, increasing competition within the Palestinian community uh, for leadership. Uh, there was the PLO, in competition that had been historically with King Hussein, the PLO was being challenged from the radical side of the spectrum uh, with Hamas, and there were Palestinians in the territories who were putting up their hands and saying, you know, we might want to speak on our own behalf. Uh, and this uh, evolved primarily as a result of the uh, Intifada, which broke out in 1987. We'll talk more about that in a moment. There was the leadership in Israel of the Likud party of Menachem Begin and uh, Yitzhak Shamir. Uh, and they were in the process of building tens of thousands of settlements, which had a 
direct impact on the U.S.-Israeli relationship. The Bush and Reagan administrations inserted themselves act actively into the U.S.-Israeli relationship, uh, not terribly keen to what Israel was doing in terms of settlements. There was a burst of Russian Jewish immigration which threatened to some Arab states anyway, the possibility that Israelis might move these new Russian immigrants into the territories, which might have an impact on the territories themselves over the long haul. There was the downfall of the Soviet Union. Um, uh, the USSR had broken diplomatic relations with Israel after June 67 and was now uh, preparing to uh, resume those negotiations. So, Aaron, if I may, um, if I can begin with you, please. Um, I sort of gave a broad outline of the decade of the 80s. Um, but what roles do you think the State Department uh, did or did not play at the beginning of the 1980s uh, that it did um, by the end of the 1980s? What changed in the decision making process at the State Department, um, which gave the United States a, a greater impact? impetus to, to be involved. We know that George Schultz made an effort, um, but what what changed from within? Um, give us your insights. I'll start with two quotes, one by Marx, Karl Marx, not Groucho Marx, who said that men, he was writing in the 19th century, men make history, but rarely as they please. That's quote number one. And number two is to paraphrase Woody Allen, who at one point or another said 80% of success in life is showing up. Marx was correct. Uh, Woody Allen was wrong. Uh, 80, 90% of success in life is showing up at the right time. And I would argue to you that whatever events uh, sought to sh during the 1980s sought to shape uh, the possibilities for Arab Israeli peacemaking, it really was a discrete event. Uh, and the implications and ramifications of that event. Uh, on one hand, and the way the United States responded to it. Uh, State Department is not the right focus here, although more, more on that in a minute. It was Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, which like previous um, Middle East peace initiatives, um, driven by violence and war, changed the calculation of regional players and provided an opportunity for a skillful and willful American administration. That would be Bush 41 and his immensely talented Secretary of State, James Addison Baker III, um, to try to put together not a substantive breakthrough, but a procedural breakthrough um, at Madrid. I would have, I would argue to you now, even looking looking back, that the last time the United States was admired, feared, and respected as a great power and had an effective foreign policy that actually made sense were the Bush and Baker years. Um, those years were driven by events that started beyond America's control, but it ended up in at least some of those events, the re reunification of Germany, the collapse of the former Soviet Union, uh, Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, Desert Shield, Desert, Desert Storm, and Madrid uh, that were very much shaped by the United States. Um, so I think it, it was the, the, the merging of new possibilities demonstrated um, by regional changes and a extremely talented national security team, including the President George H.W. Bush, uh, Brent Scowcroft as national security advisor, Dick Cheney as Secretary of Defense, and James Baker as Secretary of State, that essentially was able to capitalize on the moment. Let's be clear, unmistakably clear. Without Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, just as without the 1973 October War, just as without uh, the first Palestinian Intifada, it's highly unlikely that any of the breakthroughs, near breakthroughs and, and even failures in the Oslo process would have ever materialized. It's a sad commentary that violence and war drove 
um, drove these processes, but so be it. When the status quo, status quo changes only when the parties involved in perpetuating it suffer pain on one hand and are offered the prospects of gain on the other. And that pain gain balance shifted as a consequence of several factors. Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, the successful American military operation to expel him from Kuwait, pledges that uh, Bush 41 made to the Saudis that in the event the war was successful, he would undertake a effort, and Baker made the same commitment to the Russians and others, that he would make a commitment to see what could be done on the question of Arab-Israeli peace. A Syria led by the wily Hafez Assad, who understood that with the weakening and ultimately collapse of the former Soviet Union, Assad needed additional options. Baker offered him an intriguing possibility of an American option. A Jordanian government, long enamored and uh, in, 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 in thrall of the United States, um, who had supported Saddam in order to secure the survival of the Hashemite kingdom, or at least that was the way the United States interpreted it, was in the doghouse and needed to build a pathway back. Uh, a PLO that was playing catch up um, in large part by uh, driven by an intifada that was launched by forces beyond its control and who had also supported Saddam's invasion and who was in the doghouse, um, also was very much weakened. And in Israel, and it, it gets complicated here, I mean, Itamar's thoughts on this, I think, would be greatly appreciated. An Israel that was thrown somewhat off balance um, by the war, um, by American insistence that Israel not become engaged in, in the conflict, and the United States would handle to the extent they did, that didn't prevent the launch of 39 uh, Scud rockets against the Israelis uh, during that fateful period. But thrown off balance to some degree um, by the, by the uh, US campaign in Iraq, and um, I think very wary uh, of the um, pressures that an American administration might bring against an Israeli government that was committed not just to uh, retaining the West Bank, uh, not talking to the PLO, not attending an international conference, and continuing settlement activity. So all of these things provided the raw material for a very talented and savvy Secretary of State to undertake in Baker's case, it was a risky gamble because for, for Baker, there were three sets of negotiations. The ones that were too easy, that is that were left to other people. The mission impossibles that he left to other people. And the ones that were hard but doable. Uh, Baker admitted, though, that on with respect to Madrid, it appeared to most everyone at the time that this would be a mission impossible. He took it on anyway. And he succeeded. Aaron, just a quick follow up. Um, you have on several occasions in this response made highly complimentary and laudatory remarks about Jim Baker as Secretary of State. Um, was it ideological? Was it political? Was it something else that drove him? to reach this conclusion that you should take the victory from the Gulf War and move it to the Arab-Israeli diplomatic theater? What, was, what motivated him on the inside? Well, Baker had avoided the Middle East. He was told by Richard Nixon early, early on when he, was, he became Secretary of State that it should be avoided at all costs. Um, and Baker for his first two years, avoided it. Um, we, we had encouraged him uh, and in a low level, <clears throat> low level manner to try to initiate an Israeli-Palestinian dialogue using the Egyptians. We toyed with the idea of elections, but Baker refused to go to the region. 
it wasn't until March of 91, two years after he became Secretary of State, that he paid his first visit, which for a Secretary of State, as you know, Ken, is highly unusual. Um, <clears throat> I think Baker got involved in this partly because <clears throat> um, the Pentagon and the White House had run, run the war very successfully. Um, Baker had launched this Operation Tin Cup, which raised you know, millions uh, um, by any number of parties to pay for the war. But I think he felt that he needed somehow, if he were to be become a consequential Secretary of State, to try something very hard. And his very close friend, George H.W. Bush, had promised the Saudis um, and the Egyptians that if, in fact, the war went successfully, the U.S. would try. Brent Scowcroft was very much opposed to Baker's mission because he realized that the odds of success were uh, very long and that a failed peace uh, effort following a successful war would complicate the president's um, credibility abroad on the foreign policy side and could embroil him in a very difficult political um, mess at home, given the nature of the U.S.-Israeli relationship. So I give Baker credit because it was against his nature to try something this bold. And um, he took it on. I, I would only say, I mean, I, you're quite right. I have tremendous admiration for this man. He is one of the two most con consequential secretaries of state in the modern history of the United States, along with Henry Kissinger. And it just is underappreciated, I think, how hard it is to get anything done, whether it's German reunification, whether it's raising money to launch a war to push Saddam out of Kuwait, or whether it's putting together uh, an Arab Israeli six, successful Arab Israeli peace press. I'll leave one more point. It is my view, although as Itamar knows, it will never be tested, that had Bush 41 succeeded in defeating Bill Clinton in 1992, Baker had every intention, as he said to us when he was returning from Madrid, after I run the president's political campaign for re-election, we're coming back and we're going to do some peace treaties. It is my conviction that had Bush and Baker endured and had Rabin not been murdered, we probably would have had one agreement either between Israel and Syria and Israel and the Palestinians and the conversation that we would we would be having today would be of quite a different character. Um, Itamar, if I may um, switch over to uh, the view from the Israeli north and uh, from Syria. Uh, give us a little bit of background of, first of all, what drives Syria's zealous antagonism against Israel. And that really didn't change under Assad from when he took power in 70, right through um, his departure in early 2000. Um, and then second, what convinced Hafez al-Assad that he should go along with the Americans and he should try and participate in this Middle East peace conference when he himself had not participated, at least officially, in the 1973 conference after the 73 war. Okay, so uh, uh, Syria, you know, it's difficult to speak about a country that barely exists now, but uh, Syria in earlier decades and the original Syrian state that emerged from the French mandate after World War II, first of all, saw the, the whole, or a large part of the Levant, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Palestine, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, as part of greater natural Syria. So when they looked at the Palestinian issue, looked at Palestine, from their point of view, they were looking at part of the same homeland. Number two, uh, Syria since 1963 uh, is being uh, ruled by uh, the Ba'ath Party, uh, maybe the premier Arab Nationalist Party, and of course for Arab Nationalists, uh, the Palestine question at the time 
uh, was maybe the most most important defining uh, issue. Number three, many Syrians had numerous ties to uh, to Palestine and, and the Palestinians, same family living across uh, on both sides of the border, and uh, and so forth and, and so forth. And finally. Syria, uh, certainly since 1970 and to some extent since 1963, controlled by the Ba'ath. The Ba'ath is controlled by a minority. And we know from our experience in the Middle East and in other parts of the world that when minorities are in politics or in power, they tend to be more fanatical than the majority. They have to prove that even though they are a minority, they are as good or as loyal or as devoted as the majority. Now, with regard to Assad coming to uh, to Madrid, so Aaron uh, before mentioned one major uh, element in his decision, namely the fall of the Soviet Union, the loss of uh, his patron, and the clear sense that he had to, to find a way of getting along with the United States. Uh, number two, uh, the experience of participating in the anti-Saddam military coalition. The Syrians did not do a lot of fighting, but they were there with military units. And what they saw uh, was very persuasive for them. They saw what American weapon systems and new technologies of war meant, something they had not realized before. They also knew that much of it, or at least some of it, is available to the Israelis. And that confronted them with a reality of significant military in inferiority. And thirdly, when Assad came to Madrid, very much like Shamir, uh, Prime Minister of Israel, they did not necessarily intend to continue all the way. Aaron spoke before about Shamir's decision. Shamir said on several occasions, oh, we can negotiate for 10 or 12 years. He, he was not, not in any hurry. He, uh, he felt the U.S. pressure. He had to respond to it. There was the impact of Intifada, and he went. So Assad went for the reasons that I mentioned before. And at the time when I was uh, the negotiator with Syria, I, I used to, to compare his decision and his participation to someone who boarded a train and bought a ticket it says final destination, but he realized that he can get off the train at any given station. So to the, the final month of the Rabin's negotiations with uh, Assad and later on, we were never sure that uh, he really wanted to, to conclude. Because after all, this is a, a minority regime. Uh, it, it relies on force. It maintains a very large, maintained a very large military establishment and a very large security and intelligence establishment, all of it warranted by the fact that there was an enemy and Syria was the uh, main axis of resistance to the United States and, and Israel. If Syria were to make peace with Israel, then the question is who would need us? And we know that Assad Sr. and Assad Jr have been cautioned by many of their uh, members of the circle, don't make peace with Israel because this would be the end of us. It would be the end of what, excuse me? Of, of the regime. Because yes. then, then the, the whole justification for maintaining this type of regime and this size of military and intelligence apparatus, uh, this could no longer be warranted uh, when peace was made with Israel. So the conflict with Israel was used to sew together or glue together Assad's continuing uh, to rule and dominate Syria in the autocratic fashion in which he yes. had? Yeah, the key word is resistance. And I'll move uh, briefly to his son, Bashar, uh, who on the eve of uh, the outbreak of the Syrian uh, civil war in 2011, in a famous uh, or infamous interviewed the Wall Street Journal when asked, aren't you worried that what is happening in Egypt and other places would come to Syria as well? He said, no, no, we, uh, we, are, we symbolize for the people resistance, we stand for resistance, and no one would do to us what they did to Mubarak. 
Yeah, there's a there's a quote from Mustafa Talas, the defense minister from March of 1990. Um, and this was would be the year before the Madrid conference, about 16 or 18 months. He said, the conflict between the Arab nation and Zionism is over existence, not borders. Yeah, but uh, when Farouk Ishara, uh, uh, Assad's foreign minister, came to Washington to Blair House to meet with uh, Israel's prime minister, Ehud Barak, he says, our conflict with Israel is no longer existential, it is now territorial. Uh, he was roundly criticized for it. There was some opposition to it in Syria, but he, he said that. So they, they moved quite a distance. And let me also add parenthetically, among the many ironies of uh, the, the Syrian civil war, uh, Mustafa Atlas was very loyal to Assad, and even though he was not a huge personality, he was rewarded by becoming and remaining Minister of Defense. His son, Manaflas, a brigadier general, was Bashar Assad's closest friend. He now lives in Paris. We'll get back and uh, ask you a couple questions about um, how Rabin and why Rabin chose to test Syrian intentions. Uh, we'll get back to that in, in, in just a moment. I'd like to uh, switch tracks a little bit and move to, to Joel Greenberg, as a, who was a correspondent at the time. Uh, for the Jerusalem Post. The, the Madrid conference brought together Arab states who heretofore had not uh, sat in public with Israel. Um, of course, Egypt had sat with Israel in December of 1973, um, and there had not been a Middle East conference since. Um, there was a, a lot of discussion going on in the nine months before, as Aaron pointed out, that Jim Baker was shuttling back and forth and was crafting invitations to all the participants to join in this public display of maybe acceptance, even if it were only for show and, and not for substance. When you were in Jerusalem prior to the conference itself, uh, before you actually went to Madrid, you described for us what. Palestinian-Israeli relations were and how that at least visually changed once you got to Madrid. What I can remember most of all, you pardon me if I'll be more anecdotal, maybe less analytical than others here, but um, you know, it was very important, I guess, coming into the conference for the Israeli side to make it clear that they weren't negotiating with the Palestinians or the PLO in any way. As you remember, this was a Palestinian Jordanian delegation. There wasn't any supposed to be any official contact with them. Um, and so the whole maneuvering prior to the conference was a way to get the Palestinians to be represented in a way that would be palatable to the Israelis, in which they're not really, they can say that they're not really negotiating with the Palestinians as a separate entity. And moving to the conference itself, I mean, we um, just a, a little bit of the atmosphere there as journalists, it was very important for the Palestinian delegation on the floor and in meetings with journalists at the time to emphasize that they were taking instructions from Tunis from the PLO leadership, that they are just their representatives. They're not representatives of the Palestinians in uh, Judea and Samaria, as Shamir would call it, or the local Arabs or anything like that. Uh, the late Saab Arakat wore a kafia uh, around his jacket, uh, even into the conference hall to make it clear that they're Palestinian and this is a Palestinian nationalist delegation. Uh, Hanana Shrawi, who served as the spokeswoman, who would brief us, would brief the reporters, the Israeli reporters, the foreign reporters, would always make a point that they are in consultation with the leadership of the PLO, receiving uh, directives from them, and are actually uh, representing them, uh, even though they're part of a joint delegation with the Jordanians. It was really important for them to make that point. The Israelis, of course, for their part, their narrative was that these are local Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza Strip. They vetted, of course, the people who would be in the delegation, Haider Abdel Shafi, the leader from Gaza. Um, and they said that they're basically leaders of the local Palestinian population and that you know this was in no way negotiating with the Palestinians as a separate political entity in any way. Um, so that was definitely you know, the Palestinian angle. Um, you know, that I, that, I, that I can recall that that was a very big element of that. I mean, there are other aspects of the encounter with, with the foreign delegations and journalists that I can talk about now or later, depending on how you want, you want to go, Ken. So, um, 
explain a little bit further. Uh, what was it about speaking to the Palestinians from the Israeli point of view that was so um, intellectually or ideologically difficult? And why was it so necessary for the Palestinians to assert themselves, even though they were part of the Jordanian delegation, but to assert themselves that they really were representing the PLO? I mean, this is very different than it is today, 30 years later. I mean, now there's no difficulty for Israelis to speak to Palestinians, even if they won't, but there's no difficulty in it. Jordanian Palestinian delegation. Yeah, I'm, I think you have to remember that in those days, the very idea of acknowledging any kind of Palestinian national entity that Israel is going to negotiate with or a Palestinian national movement like the PLO implied some form of recognition. It just was was unacceptable, still anathema politically. Um, you know, it was, remember when this was, I mean, this was really a period when, when Israel absolutely would not, you know, officially would not speak to the PLO. I remember, you know, in the preceding years when you had the first intifada, any attempt to raise any kind of makeshift Palestinian flag was immediately taken down by Israeli soldiers. People would be doing this clandestinely. You know, any Palestinian nationalist expression was absolutely not allowed. And, um, you know, I remember when the Palestinians made their declaration of independence in Algiers, the Israelis shut down all the cities to prevent celebration. Anyway, the, the, the concept of negotiating with a Palestinian you know, a, a delegation that represents the Palestinian national movement or the PLO in any way was not something that the Israeli leadership was, was willing at that time to do. Of course, today that's very different. Um, and again, for the Palestinians, it was just as important then to say, we are not local representatives. The Israelis would always talk about that, you know, or, or it goes back to Menachem Begin, autonomy for the, for the the Arabs in Judea and Samaria, et cetera. In other words, we're not representing the local Arabs or the people in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. We are part of a national movement where they're representatives to the conference and those are the people we're in touch with. So for them, it was just as important to make it clear that they were a national delegation of a national movement negotiating with the Israelis. And, and that was a very, you know, that of course changed over the years. Um, and, you know, Oslo was a big breakthrough on that. And of course, today you have a situation where, you know, Israel is negotiating. You've even had occasion under Netanyahu and, and even Omar, his predecessor, where you had the Palestinian flag in the prime minister's residence when meeting with Mahmoud Abbas. So that's a huge change. It used to be illegal to even wave a homemade flag in the West Bank. I remember as a reporter, so that soldiers running after people for raising these flags on on telephone poles or other things. So yes, it's definitely gone through a sea change and that, it was a different atmosphere then, a different perception then of, of how they could talk to each other at Madrid. And absolutely no discussion or thought in anyone's mind of a two state solution, which has come to dominate almost all discussion now when we talk about a Palestinian Israeli uh, future uh, kind of agreement. It, it was, wasn't even thought about, wasn't even heard of. Well, it wasn't broached. I mean, I think the Palestinians, of course, would say that they were always aiming for that. But, but, but you know, I mean, think about the concept, uh, you know, in the Egypt-Israel Treaty that there would be uh, autonomy for the Palestinians in those territories. And then moving, you know, moving beyond that, it was, it was a gradual process. It was a developing process. And uh, it was, certainly wasn't, you know, uh, openly on the table as far as the Israelis were concerned at that point. And some people would argue even in Oslo, there were caveats on the way to that. So yeah, no, that was far from, you know, the kind of rhetoric and the kind of conversation and vocabulary that's being used today. It was a different vocabulary then. Well, we'll get back to you in a moment, Joel. I'd like to hear your thoughts about is Israel's pitch to the Arab world as personified by a member of their delegation by the name of um, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, but we'll, we'll save that for a moment. Aaron, in the negotiations that unfolded to get to Madrid, can you tell us a little bit about what you remember or recall or you've learned on what Baker and Bush expected to come out of Madrid? I mean, merely having a conference, and you and I have used this term more often than not on making distinctions between what is real and what is um, um, transitory. We've used the term, what's the difference between a, a transaction and what is a transformation? Um, 
was there any expectation at all on the part of the United States that something transformational would occur given what they were dealing with, with Yitzhak Shamir and the, the Likud government? No, none. In fact, Baker yeah. went to extreme lengths to reduce expectations and make it unmistakably clear that this would be the beginning of a process. Um, these are my words, not his, but I think it reflected his thinking that Madrid would create what I think he hoped to would be an investment trap. That is to say, the minute that Israelis sat down with a Jordanian Palestinian delegation or with Palestinians themselves, the minute Jordanians and Israelis sat down in official and formal public negotiations, and specifically the minute that Israelis and Syrians sat down, that it would be harder for any of the parties to Madrid to say, well, there's nobody at the other end of the table to talk to. Madrid was a figurative table designed to launch a process. And beyond Baker's, and I, I would throw in mine, and just about everyone else on the American side's expectations, the 90s were the only decade in the last century in which there was no major Arab-Israeli war, 48, 56, 67, 73, 82. The 90s came and went without a major Arab-Israeli war. And I would argue to you without, and Baker was the last person to claim credit for any of this. But I remember that the afternoon, uh, right before Shabbat, Friday afternoon on the 18th of October, after he and Boris Penkin at the King David Hotel announced that the parties would be invited to Madrid to attend a peace conference, he went back to his suite and there he was overlooking the walls of the old city. And I, I walked in and I congratulated him. And he said, he turned around and I said, Aaron, don't get your hopes up. If you boys were smart, you should get off the train right now because it could be all downhill after this. And that was Baker lowering expectations. But the truth is, it was not downhill after that. Whether it was Madrid, whether it was US assurances, whether it was the secret Oslo channel, which broke after 10 rounds of unsuccessful negotiations, which served as a front, frankly, to some degree to hide what was actually occurring between Israelis and Palestinians. And Itamar can speak to this again, whether it was just hundreds and thousands of hours of negotiation in formal, informal, secret, not secret meetings between Israelis and Syrians, whether it was the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty, whether it was the follow-up from the Oslo Accords under three agreements under Benjamin Netanyahu, or two, and then one under Barack, the 90s came and went without a major conflagration. And I think Madrid, I didn't say Madrid was the key, but Madrid was the kind of launching point that made Baker's investment trap real. You know, he had this expression, I'm going to leave a dead cat at their doorstep if they don't agree. And he used the dead cat tactic with the Palestinians, with the Israelis, and with the Syrians. He said as much to each of them. Um, and I think the fear of the dead cat being left at your doorstep was somehow, somehow created a dynamic along with serious negotiations that in the end, all of it didn't work. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> with the exception of the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty, most of it fell apart or was unrealized. But that's why I think Madrid, that's why Madrid had meaning for me. Itamar, let's return to Syria, if you would. Um, Yitzhak Rabin chose you to be ambassador in your biography of Rabin, soldier, leader, statesman. He took the view that um, the main threats to Israel's national interest were to the east, Iran, Iraq, uh, 
maybe to the north. Why did he think about testing Syrian intentions? What what were his expectations? Well, I think I think he actually preferred the Syrian deal to the Palestinian deal. First of all, when Gene Baker on his last trip as Secretary of State to the Middle East before he went to the White House, told Rabin that uh, Assad was willing to make a uh, Sadat-like peace with Israel and that the Bush-Baker administration would underwrite it, would support it. And that captured his imagination because until that point, he did not think that Assad was willing to make that kind of peace. So my job, in a way, was to, when I was appointed by him as negotiator, was to find out whether that was feasible, which was not easy. Now, clearly, a breakthrough could be made on either the Palestinian or the Syrian track. The Jordanians and Lebanese were not candidates for first agreement. Um, Syria had advantages over the, the Palestinians. It was a simpler conflict, not the national conflict between two, uh, two nations fighting over the same uh, country. Syria was a state, uh, unlike uh, the community that the Palestinians were. And, Assad, and Rabin preferred Assad to Arafat. Assad was tough, very tough to come to an agreement, but when he made one, he kept it. The 73 arrangements made by Henry Kissinger were kept religiously uh, by, uh, by Assad. And Arafat was absolutely not trusted by Rabin, at least at, at, uh, at that time. So that was his preference. The problem was that Assad would not move. He said, okay, I'm willing to make peace, but I won't tell you what peace meant before you committed to full withdrawal from the Golan. To which our answer would be, you don't begin a negotiation with the bottom line. We are not telling you that it will never happen, but you'll have to find out in a gradual negotiation. And this remained the case until the dramatic moment in August 1993, when Rabin had, had the uh, outline of the almost completed Oslo Accords with the Palestinians, and he wanted to make for the last time to find out whether Assad was or was not a, a partner, and he gave uh, Secretary of State Christopher the famous quote-unquote deposit with a conditional hypothetical willingness to withdraw from the Golan in return for Egyptian-like peace. That was an exercise that unfortunately failed. So we remained with these question marks about Assad until Rabin's death, and in a way we remain with them to date. You want to define conditional hypothetical willingness? You see, uh, Aaron is smiling because I used to have this argument with the American peace team because they said commitment. Uh, he did not commit to withdraw from the, from the Golan Heights. He said, if you give me the kind of, of peace that he gave me, a package of peace and security, then I would be willing to withdraw fully from the Golan. By the way, the, the words, the lines of June 4, 1967 were not used at the time by Assad. He only drew that card out of his pocket uh, later. So uh, what I say, if you do this and that is for me a hypothetical conditional uh, willingness to withdraw and not a commitment. But the Clinton administration always used the term and, and some members of that administration still use it uh, to date. But, you know, of all the debates that you can have on the Arab-Israeli peace process, this is the least important uh, argument. Ravine was not getting any pressure from the Clinton administration, was he? He was. There were moments um, when uh, Secretary Christopher and President Clinton thought that he was not moving sufficiently rapidly or seriously. And the Syrian negotiators and I were once uh, summoned to Christopher's office and were rebuked for this. It was such a serious rebuke that I felt, I told Rabin on the phone, I think I may, I need to make a special trip to Israel to convey this to you, not in a telegram, not over the phone, because the secretary is very serious about this and he needs to see that we are responding uh, seriously. But, you know, on the whole, it was a very friendly relationship between the administration, the government, and between Clinton and, and Rabin. So if you compare it to quote unquote pressures, let's say under the Bush administration with the Shamir government, this was, you know, very soft. 
or 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 even Carter telling Rabin during his first term as prime minister that you have to consider negotiating with the PLO and not doing it privately, but actually doing it publicly. I mean, it's a very different kind yeah. of atmosphere between the president yeah. and the prime minister. Until, until Netanyahu's visits to the White House, the Rabin visit to Carter was the worst ever visit by an Israeli prime minister to a U.S. Uh, president. Now that we've mentioned um, Benjamin Netanyahu, let's get back to Joel um, and uh, talk about uh, Netanyahu's pitch as deputy foreign minister to um, Al Jazeera and, and to um, Arab viewers. What do you recollect about that? And what was the, what was the purpose? You know, I think it's important to kind of set the background a little bit. You know, this conference was at the time a very rare opportunity for uh, Israeli journalists um, uh, and Arab journalists, you know, from the entire Arab world to interact, officials meeting journalists from both sides and people from both sides. It was kind of a groundbreaking atmosphere there. Um, there it's been very rare and, you know, and few and far between. Since then, of course, there have been a lot more, but at that time, it was a quite an unusual encounter. And one of the sensations, as I recall at the time, was that Netanyahu, as deputy foreign minister, who saw this as part of his job, of course, gave and interviewed Al Jazeera. At that time, that was a novelty. You know, a senior Israeli government official uh, giving an interview to an Arab satellite channel um, was was a, was a rarity. I, I don't know if it had happened before. It was it was considered really unusual, and it was a, it was kind of a sensation both in the Arab and the Israeli press corps. And of course, part of Netanyahu's mode of operation, of course, that we know is to kind of go directly. To the public, appeal through television, go over the leadership, etc. He's done it many times. He's, he 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 elevated that to kind of an art form. Today, it's a lot more common to see Arab satellite channels interviewing an Israeli official or Arab news outlets. But then it was much much rarer, and it was seen as a really a, a unusual uh, media move by the Israeli side. And um, you know, this was this was something that attracted a lot of attention, as I recall, when we were covering when we were covering the conference on the sidelines of the conference. The whole media encounter was, was, was part of, of, of the show that was going on there, or part of what was going on aside from the substantive you know, encounters in the negotiating room. So, so I think that you know, Netanyahu crafted that and, and kind of pioneered that. And now, of course, uh, Al Jazeera interviewing Israelis or for satellite channels or Arab outlets interview Israeli officials now, you know, it's not, it's not as remarkable, but then it was quite remarkable. Do any of you want to um, make some final conclusions or um, speak about something that you weren't yeah. about? I would, when Aaron particularly defined the term that made, made Madrid so unique, you cannot avoid thinking about the present and think that almost all the conditions that were available then and, and made Madrid possible are not available today. Uh, a U.S. administration not interested, uh, a weakened U.S. Uh, position, an Israeli government that cannot make any fundamental decisions because of its complexity, uh, a weak uh, Palestinian uh, partner in non-existent Syria. So I think that today we can look uh, almost nostalgically at uh, Madrid and try to, or we'll have to settle on much more modest progress that could possibly be made in Arab-Israeli relations. One of the great uh, quotations from um, the uh, U.S. ambassador to Israel, Samuel Lewis, was, um, and he said this numerous times on numerous occasions, he said, um, the, the mediator can't want an agreement more than the respective sides. And if the respective sides don't want an agreement, there's no amount of cajoling, urging, or mediation that um, the outside party can do in, in order to affect um, compromise. Um, I think you're quite right, Itamar. I, I don't think there are leaders in place and there certainly isn't a preparedness to make the political trade-offs uh, that might be necessary in order to bring this to uh, something more than what it now is, just managing a non-war situation. Well, not, not to end on a completely annoyingly negative note, which is, <laughs> which is basically how I usually end. Um, I think if you took a look at the Arab-Israeli confrontation line in 1948, and you took a look at the Arab-Israeli confrontation line in 2021, even the most hard-bitten cynic uh, 
and skeptic, uh, an annoyingly negative analyst, would have to admit that there have been some remarkable changes over time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think um, the Abraham Accords are of a very peculiar nature, but I'm still amazed by the, it, it's not the intractability of the issue. The Israeli-Palestinian issue is intractable and un, understandably intractable for, for very sound reasons. Um, But the real question is whether or not we've seen the last of the large confrontations. Um, Some argue that 73 was the last major confrontation in in military terms of any two countries in the world. I don't think there's not been any kind of similar engagement since 1973 deploying tanks and aircraft uh, with the intensity and frequency of that war. Others, other things have taken their place, an Iranian-Israeli uh, perspective confrontation, asymmetrical wars between Hamas and Israel, and hopefully not another one between Hezbollah and Israel. So it's a different kind of conflict with expectations reduced to their proper scale. I don't think that's particularly annoying. I think that's particularly honest. I think Itamar said it too, that the the conditions just aren't right. Um, They're just not in place. Um, And no matter how much people from the outside constantly are urging and urging and urging for consideration of making progress, it's pretty tough to do it when the sides aren't ready and their institutions aren't prepared uh, to make the the kinds of, of necessary compromises that would be required, that even that Rabin was considering, if you behave this way, if you do that, um, we'll, we'll, we'll consider. Can I ask Itamar a question? Sure. Itamar, had Rabin lived, what, what, what do you think might have been changed? There would have been a, a serious attempt uh, between him and Arafat to come to, to an agreement in 96. I don't know how this would have ended. Had it failed, it would not necessarily have had the consequences of the failure of Ken David. But I think Rabin would have been more adroit at uh, dealing with the failure. That's well said. Joel, Aaron, Itamar, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Joel. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, thank Ken, you. for organizing. Bye-bye. Good to see you all. Several people have been um, most helpful in making this uh, webinar unfold. I'd like to thank uh, Michelle Friesman and Heather Waters. I'd like to thank Tal Grinfuss David and uh, Michael Jacobs. Michael and Tal have put some very interesting materials of uh, the Madrid conference on our homepage. Um, it can be found on the left hand top in the box. Um, if you want to learn more about the peace conference, the speeches, there's a wonderful uh, short video that sort of condenses what happened from the end of the Gulf War uh, right through the period uh, after the conference. And there are uh, lots of other small items there, including some materials which educators might find uh, truly interesting. So uh, visit the homepage, www.israeled.org. Thank you all for joining us, Joel and Aaron, since you're both there. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your erudition. Thank you for analysis. Thank you. thank you, Ken. CIE is very, very, very fortunate to have you, truly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.